Okay, we're, this summer we're doing a series, uh, Kingdom Life, and we're going to continue that. And la- a couple weeks ago, we didn't meet last week, but a couple weeks ago, we got this concept that I want to keep reinforcing. God reveals who he is through what he does. He doesn't try to do things to get us to notice who he is. He just says, out of who I am flows what I do, and if you look at what I do, you'll know who I am. And very often we do the opposite of that. We try to create an identity through what we do rather than it flowing out of who we already are. And God also, we see in the Bible, primarily and mostly identifies us through our relationship with him. That's our primary identity comes from that. God says, I created you to be this, and he declared an identity, and we looked at that a couple uh, weeks ago with the first human beings, but they walked away from that and decided, I'm going to try to create my own identity through what I do rather than just living by my God-declared identity. And of course, that failed for them and it fails for us as well. Whenever you and I try to get our identity from what we do or something other than God, really what we've done is we've made a little idol and set it up. We're trying to put something else in the place of God to be our functional Savior, the thing that we get happiness, contentment, purpose, joy from. It's something other than God. And because God's the creator and he didn't design things to work that way, that's always going to fail at some point. And then we're going to have various reactions to that. And God says, listen, instead of that, you can go back to my declared identity for you, what I intended from the beginning And even though there's no way for you to accomplish that or do that, I've sent my own son, God the Son, Jesus, to make it possible for you to have that identity again. And it's not through what you do, it's through what Jesus has done. And then you can have a new identity. You can be in my family, in my kingdom, and you can live that out. Not not to earn my approval, but to live out the identity that I intend for you. So, This morning, I want us to look at, we're going to start, we're going to look at several places, and that's something different we're doing this summer. Rather than just studying through a book, we're kind of looking at different places and putting together a lot of the knowledge and background that that God has, continues to give us as we study through his word. But Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And uh, if you have an app on your device, whatever device you might have, um, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version For uh, some of this, I'll tell you if I'm not, but if you want to be in the same one at least to start, uh, English Standard. If you have your own print Bible, I trust you can find out where to find it. And if you don't have a Bible or an app, you should be able to find one of these uh, black Bibles on the seat in front of you or very close to you. And in those will be on page 835. 835. And um, if you don't have your own Bible, a print Bible at home, Please take that one with you. That's what they're there for, is for make sure, to make sure people have a copy of God's Word. So Jesus is speaking. Uh, this was after he'd gone to the cross, after he rose from the dead, after he'd spent over a month with his followers, his disciples. And he says this right before he physically leaves earth in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's confirming here, I am the creator God. My Father and I are one. I have all the authority that he, he has in our roles within the Godhead as Father, Son, and Spirit. We share that he's delegated that authority to me. I have all authority. And he says, so because I have that, you can rest assured as I give you this mandate, I have the authority f- to give this to you, to delegate this to you. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. When he says, in the name of here, what he's really saying, he's reaffirming that authority thing. He says, it's under the authority of the Creator God, the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He says, I have that authority. I'm delegating it to you. As you go out and tell people they can be citizens of God's kingdom, that they can be members of God's family, again, through what I've accomplished, through my death on the cross, my resurrection from the dead. And when they accept that, when they believe that, then you baptize them under our authority. It's not under a church's authority. It's not under a person's. It's under the creator God's authority. And that's the primary meaning of that phrase there. But 
as we look at that, he says, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. As we see that, he says, what you're going to do when they accept that message, when they accept that identity that I've provided for them, that my Father declares for them, we're going to do this symbolic picture of identification. You're going to dunk them in water, and that's why we typically as a church do baptism through dunking people in water. We're going to dunk them in water signifying you're dying to your old identity, your old way of life. You're rising from the, the death of that to a new identity, a new way of life in Christ as children of God, citizens of God's kingdom. And those, the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, give us a glimpse into our identity, the new identity that we have. So today, what we want to look at is the first one that's mentioned here. And it just worked out peachy that it's Father's Day, right? <laughs> so um, God is Father. How do we know that? Well, as we look at what He does in particular with Jesus, God the Son, we see that he's a father. It reveals to us who he already is. He's already a father. And he's our father, but we'll, we'll see that as we go through. So let, we're going to take a brief, brief flyover of some highlights from the Old Testament. As we look at God, the Father, interacting with Jesus, God the Son, we see God is Father. The first, I want to just look at, start back in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And you can look these up or not. I think they'll be on the screen as well. This is a famous passage, especially at Christmas. Um, part of Handel's Messiah is based on um, this passage. But this was a prophecy written hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. It says this, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, we could unpack that for a couple of weeks right there, but we're just looking at it briefly. He says, a child's going to be born. He'll be the Prince of Peace, but he's also one with the Everlasting Father. He's also Almighty God. In um, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, Joseph, who is engaged to marry a young woman to be married, they're, they're Jewish people, and, and they both assume the other one wants to walk with God and follow him. They're waiting for his kingdom. They're waiting for his promised Savior to come. And Joseph finds out that Mary's pregnant, and he knows the child isn't his. And he's debating, I don't know if I want to continue to go through with this marriage to her because she's already been unfaithful. And he, he didn't want to punish her, but he's like, I don't know if I can partner with someone for life that's done this already. And then God speaks to him in a dream at night and says this in Matthew 1, 20 through 23, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. What she told you is true. <laughs> this really happened. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Jesus is a Greek form of Joshua, which is a name that signifies being a savior. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Here's another quote, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is about 30 years old. John, one of his relatives, is preaching um, in response to what God has directly told him that I'm here to prepare the way for God's kingdom. It's near at hand. Um, the Savior is coming, the Messiah, the promised one that the prophets told about. And so he was doing the baptism thing too. So you need to do this to identify that you're dying to your old way of life, getting ready for God's kingdom and his promised Savior. And you're rising up with a new perspective, a new identity, a new life. And Jesus comes and John says, hey, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I should be baptizing you. And Jesus says, well, I'm not repenting. I'm not changing my mind about my old way of life, but I want to identify with your message. And so this, we need to do this. And so he gets baptized, and it says, that's where we pick it up, Matthew 3, 16 and 17. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. So John dunks him. He comes up. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The father speaks, says, I'm a father. You can see that as I interact with my son. He says, son, 
you won't, you're not going to read these words in Scripture because this is my paraphrase. But <laughs> you go, son, way to go. This is, it's kind of like what some of us go to a sports game, you know, with our kids are playing or maybe it's grandkids depending on your age bracket. Like, that's my kid, <laughs> especially after they just knocked one out of the park. But he's like, nice one, son. And then... That passage just a little farther on that we're all pretty familiar with, at least the first part of it, John 3, 16 through 18, God so loved the world that he gave his only, what is it? Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not Believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. God's, God reveals to us, I'm a father. And I, you can, as you look how I interact with Jesus, my son, you can see that I'm a father. God is a father, and he reveals it through Jesus, God the Son. And God now tells us that he is our father through Jesus if we accept what Christ has done. I want to read from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 6. Again, I'm reading from English Standard Version. It says you, and when that you there means us, <laughs> all of us. We were dead in the trespasses and sin in which we once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with who? Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. He says, through Jesus, you're now dead to your old life, that life that was just, you lived according to the dictates of yourself. It was all self-focused. Even when you did good stuff, even when I did good stuff, it was because of, I was trying to get people to notice me or think I was a good person or whatever, show that I, nobody was my boss. He says, no, now you have a new identity. You're a child of God. You're a citizen of his kingdom. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says this. I'm going to read this one from the New Living Translation. Since you, and that's those of us that are in Christ, have been raised to new life with Christ, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sight on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, this passage often, at least in my years, I've often heard it misapplied. <laughs> it's like, so don't think about anything that's going on here. That's not what it's saying. <laughs> saying just, just think about heaven all the time. and Think about getting out of here. No, he's saying, listen, instead of identifying with that old life, that's not real life. That's not what you were intended for. That's not what God the creator had planned when he created this earth. And when Adam and Eve walked away, and as we all have walked away from our God-declared identity, he says, that's not what God intended for you. That's not how he wants us to live. That's not what... His design is for human beings. So set your sights on the real reality, the thing that's going to last for eternity, God's perspective, the heavenly perspective. That's what's real. And what is the heavenly or permanent reality he wants us to think about? It's not based on my earthly biological family. Today is Father's Day. For many people, it's... a uh, um, that's a good thing, and if your father is still living, um, you probably have called him or you're going to call him or you sent him a card or something. A couple of my kids already have put stuff on Facebook for me or texted me this morning. Um, they know I get up early, so it wasn't too early, you know. Some of them will drop by today. That's a great thing. Some of you, if your dad's passed, you might be missing him and thinking about things that he had a positive impact on your life. But on the other hand, you might have grown up in a family where dad wasn't a very good dad, where he wasn't a great example, where you weren't sure about his relationship with you. God says, listen, 
when you become my child and my family, it's not based on your experience, positive or negative, in your biological family. If it was positive, that might give you some good clues, but you really need to look at how I interacted with my son Jesus to see what a good father is about. That's why this morning we're not doing 21 steps to be a better father. <laughs> There's just one step, really. I mean, that's simplifying it. Look at how God interacts with Jesus. You'll know what a good father is like. You'll know where the right boundaries are. You'll know the appropriate actions to take. And God says, that's the reality, the permanent reality, the heavenly reality. I'm your father, and I'm the same kind of father for you that I am for my son, Jesus. Romans 8, 14 through 17 says this, New Living Translation again, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Some people think a relationship with God is I'm enslaved to him and he's going to make me do stuff I don't want to do, right? We've all heard this, maybe even said ourselves like, don't ever say you won't be a missionary to Africa because God, he's a stinker. He'll make you go, you know. He's just waiting for you to hear it. Like he doesn't know what you're thinking, right? Like, I won't say it out loud, okay? God's not going to be able to know. Really? Doesn't that negate everything we know about God in the Bible? <laughs> he knows everything. You haven't received, you and I have not received a spirit that makes us fearful slaves. Instead, we receive God's spirit when he adopted us as his own children. Now we call him Abba. <laughs> For those of you in my age bracket, that's, this isn't referring to a Swedish pop group from the 70s. Okay. <laughs> that's not it. Uh, this is a term that they didn't translate really into English, but it has the idea of daddy. It's an intimate, loving term for your father, daddy, dad. He says, now we call the creator, the king of the universe, daddy, father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Did you read what, did you hear that? Did you see it? He says, you're not just children you're God's children, the creator of the universe, the Lord of everything, and you're co-heirs with Jesus. Everything that Jesus gets from his Father, you share in, we share in. Is that astounding? A couple of people went like this. If we were at a Huskers game, your response would be different, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah! And see, we take this for granted. I, I think that we close off our hearts to the reality of what God says we have. Our president right now, he's got a younger kid, right? Baron, little guy. Do you think um, he calls his dad's secretary to make appointments to see him? In the Oval Office? Hey, I need to see my dad this week. Can you make me an appointment sometime afternoon? Does he have a half hour free? What do you suppose he probably does if he's on the ground? He probably walks in, right? I'm going to guess. I know other presidents have had this happen too. Sometimes the kid walks in when they're not supposed to. They don't care. Why? That's their dad. He's the president of the United States, but it's their dad. They have access. Normally, they'd have access. God says, you have that with me. I've given you my spirit who lives inside of you to remind you that you're my children. You're joint heirs with Jesus, God the Son. Wow. Who is God? He is a father, the father, our father through Jesus. So how do we know that? We see how he interacts with Jesus but what does God do with us? How does he reveal he is our father to us? He loves us and he provides for us. He made it possible for us to be in his family, first of all, and then he does way beyond that as any good father would do. Who are we then? Based on our God-declared identity, we are children of God. We are family. So then what, how should we live that out? It's not, we're not doing that to get into the family. Hey, if you do enough good stuff, you'll be my kid this week. <laughs> if you're a dad and you said that to your kids this week, you should take that back. <laughs> That's not a good thing. 
No, he says, you're already my children. Now I want you to live out who you are. That's a totally different motivation. We're not just children of God. We're part of his family. We're children of the king, heirs with God the son. So what we do should flow out of that identity. Does that, does that make sense to you? You could not, it would be great if you nod your head and go, yes, that makes sense. If it doesn't, go like this. Okay, mostly this. A few of you were really subtle though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So then what do we do? How do we live that out? And we're going to unpack this uh, over next week in very practical ways, but I want us to get this concept. Then we love each other as family. 1 John 4, 19 through 20, English Standard Version. We love... We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. (laughs) Wow, that's pretty simplistic, isn't it? (laughs) He goes, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. He says, if you're in the family, parents, if you've got any summer trips planned and you have kids that are um, high school age down that are traveling with you, what's going to be one of the big things on that trip, especially if it's a long car trip? Just get along, would you, right? Don't make me pull over (laughs) or turn around. We'll go back home. You just want them to, just like, your your brothers and sisters love each other, but boy, we find that tough, don't we? Our kids find it tough. Nobody sits down and says, now listen, we want some excitement on this trip, so about half an hour into it, I want you to reach over, sock your sister as hard as you can, just to make it interesting, because, you know, the radio is boring. We don't do that. We don't have to teach them that, do we? It just comes naturally. We love because we love because we're already loved by our Father. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus speaking. Right before he goes to the cross, he says, Now I'm giving you a new commandment. He's talking to his disciples. Love each other. That wasn't new. God's told us to do that. But if he stopped there, we'd go, Well, that doesn't make sense. But he doesn't. He says, just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Did you catch that? I think what we did last week serving Sunday was great and awesome. I think we need to do more of that, not just on an organized day, but when you and I see needs in our community that God has given us the resources to meet those needs and do good work so people glorify our Father in heaven and give us an opportunity to share the good news with them. It would be great if we just grab a couple of our friends and say, hey, let's, let's meet this need. Let's go and serve this person. You, you don't need pastors or Jill or Brian as much work as they put in, and, and they would be the first ones to say, and a bunch of people were helping and organizing that and carrying it out, and it was great. But we can do that anytime. And our purpose in doing it last Sunday was to give us all a low commitment, low responsibility opportunity to actually live out our identity in Christ so that we might go, I could do that. I could do that. God could use me. Yes. Can I? Somebody came to me. I, this, I have to tell at least one story from it. A couple of weeks ago, older lady goes to the evening service. She works at the hospital. And she said, hey, in this whole serving Sunday thing, um, I went to the chaplain at the hospital and I said, could you give me a list of people that are here a long time, have been here a long time and don't get many visitors and I would like to visit them. And they said, of course, you know what the chaplain said. Yes, we'll do that. And she came to me and she was telling me, which I I was glad I got to hear it. She goes, would that be okay? (laughs) No. (laughs) Yes, it's okay. And I, I even told her, I said, and you don't have to ask me. But, I, I mean, I'm glad I know about it because it was just cool to hear about it. It's like, you can do that anytime if you want. And I thought, God's working because she, she really already committed, but she then afterwards, probably because of church experience in some way, you know, it's like, oh, is that okay? Should I check it out with a pastor? Yes, everything you should do, do this week, you should check with a pastor first. Wake up. No. <laughs> I, that's why I have caller ID. I don't want all those calls. <laughs> I, you, we all need to live out the identity we have, correct? Yes, shake your head. Even if you don't agree, just shake your head. Yes, yes, okay. Jesus said, I, this is how people are going to see 
that you belong in my family, how you interact with each other. That's the main proof. What are some of the common ways a healthy family shows love? A healthy family, whether you had a healthy family or not. How does a healthy family show love to each other? There's tons of ways, many practical things, but let me just give you a couple. They talk to each other, right? Have you ever gone over to somebody's like they're having a family thing and you go in and nobody talks to each other? You go, wow, this is super healthy, right? No, you're like, something's off here. They don't even talk to each other. They often eat together. I realize that's dying out in our culture. I think it's an attack of Satan. <laughs> We're so busy, I can't, can't even eat together. Sharing your home, sharing a meal together opens up intimacy in ways that we don't fully grasp many times. They play together. Uh, we live in an apartment. We have a pool. In the summer, our grandkids love us. <laughs> they want to come over a lot. And there's a big lawn, and son-in-laws come, and daughters, and sons, and daughter-in-laws, and we, we can play in the pool, and, and they're horsing around. That just sh that's healthy. They help each other with daily life. If they're in the home, out of the home. Some of my adult children think their mother's name is Siri. She'll get calls, Mom, where is this in Walmart? It's like, look around. That's what I would say. That's why they don't call me. <laughs> they call their mom. They're, they help each other with daily life. They grieve together. They celebrate together. When somebody in the family has something go well or they accomplish something, everyone's like, awesome, right? When, when something goes wrong, they're like, ah, man, that's too bad. And they try to encourage each other. Those are some of the things. You probably can think of others, but God says that's how we show the world around us that we're in his family. What does this mean for us? Who is God? He's our father. And what has he done for us then? Because he's our father, how does he reveal he's our father? He loves us by sending his son to die for our sins. He's already accomplished that. Who are we then if we are going to accept our God-declared identity, change our thinking, in other words, repent, from our old way of life thinking, I'm going to determine who I am. No, you, Well, okay, but it's not going to work because you weren't designed to do that. That's not how the Creator set it up. Who are we? We're the dearly loved children of God, God's family. He is well pleased with us, just like He said to His Son. I'm well pleased with you because we're in Jesus. And if you and I believe this and we're going to live out this God-declared identity, what will we do? We'll love each other as brothers and sisters the same way God has loved us. Boy, that's sometimes the tough part, isn't it? I want to read a couple more. This won't be up on the screen. Romans 5, 8 through 10, from a more uh, recent um, version of the Bible. It says this, Romans 5, 8 through 10. God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death when we were of no use whatsoever to him, not based on what we did at all. Now that we're set right with God by means of the sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there's no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If when we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of His Son, now that we're at our best, in other words, because we're in His family through Jesus, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of His resurrection life. God has perfectly loved us so that through us, he might love others. His love is poured into us by his spirit. What if you and I, as family, loved each other, our church family, our spiritual family, this way? What if we did that, not just in these walls, in this building, for an hour or two on Sunday? What if we loved each other out in public where other people saw that, and it actually spilled over to them. A lot of that happened last Sunday. I want to read one more passage. Again, it won't be up on screen from a more recent uh, version of the Bible. James 3, 17 through 18. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. Oh. <laughs> Did you just do the same thing? 
It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings. Not hot one day, cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. Some of you, probably many of you, are doing these things already. So I'm not challenging you to add more stuff to your schedule or list of activities, other things to check off. I'm asking all of us to listen to the Holy Spirit, to interact with our family, our spiritual family, as well as our biological family, and be more intentional every day as children of the King, the creator of the universe, living out the life of Jesus. And so this week, for those of us that are in God's family, I want to encourage you, discuss with a couple of your brothers and sisters. Get out of your own head. Talk with some other people around you. What are healthy ways that we can love each other like family? How can we do this better, more consistently? This isn't to critique or criticize each other. It's how can we encourage each other to live out the identity that we already have in Christ? And how can we help each other to do this? Not just what are some tips for me to do it, but how can we all work together to do this? And what can we do this week to live out our identity as family and do it in healthy ways and love each other? What can we practically do? And then always great to invite God in the conversation, pray together. Thank Him for your brothers and sisters, your fellow citizens in the kingdom. Thank him that you can encourage each other and ask him for his specific direction on how you can do that with the people that you're, you're hanging out with that time. Okay, so that's the plan. That's my challenge to you. At, at the end of the service when we close, uh, there will be some of our elders, our church leaders up at the front. Um, if you would like to find out how you can be in God's family because you're not sure, they'd be glad to talk with you about that as would I and probably a number of other people here. Also, if you want someone just to pray with you about whatever uh, that's going on, those guys will be available for you to do that. So guys that are doing that, elders, if you could come up uh, on that last song after the offering, kind of get up here so people can see and know that you're just not other people standing, hanging out up here. That'd be great too. So let's pray and then we'll worship God. Father, thanks. It's Father's Day and some of us had great dads, uh, some of us didn't. Some of us, maybe dad wasn't even present in our lives. But we're so thankful that what you give us and the identity that you declare for us as your children, sons and daughters, is not based on that experience at all. It's not based on how well we've done. For those of us that are men here that have children, it's based on you and you alone and your declaration and your provision through Jesus. Thank you for making that possible. Thank you for allowing us to have this new identity, this new life, so that we can live as you intended for us to live and for that to go on for eternity, not just a little while, and then we don't have to wait for eternity either. Uh, It's just mind-boggling, Father. and We thank you for that. Help us to live that out, to get a better grasp on that, not just for knowledge's sake, but that we might live out the life that you've given us in Jesus. And we come to you in his name because you've made that possible for us. Amen.